Okay. Um, good afternoon and welcome to today's lunchtime lecture. Uh, I'm Paul McMillan, I'm from the chemistry department and I'm a member of the lunchtime lecture committee and I'm your chair for today. So before we begin, could everyone please make sure that your phones are switched off? Thank you. So today's lecture is uh, by Professor Marc-Olivier Coppens uh, from the Department of Chemical Engineering. And who, so he's going to be speaking about uh, nature-inspired principles for engineering. Marc. Thank you very much, Paul. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for coming or for uh, watching online. So I will indeed speak about my passion today, lessons that we can learn from nature to design new solutions to problems in energy, in water, sustainability, and health. And that's the things we're exploring in the Center for Nature Inspired Engineering here at UCL, which is very multidisciplinary, stretches across disciplines from computer science, chemical engineering, all the way to, uh, to architecture and biochemical engineering. Now, a couple of years ago, I was up north, really up north, very close to the North Pole in Spitsberg and Svalbard, to see the conditions there, minus 40 degrees C. Remarkably, and this picture is taken in July, you see that there are large mammals, such as these specially adapted Svalbard reindeer who can live there, who have very, very thick snouts. And the reason why they have these thick snouts is that otherwise they would have to rely too much on eating ice, which consumes a lot of useful energy to get their water. And so these snouts act as water and heat exchangers, and so when they breathe out, you so don't see their breath, and they can get a lot of uh, water, just even out of dr dry Arctic air. A month ago, I was in a very different place in Namibia, plus 40 degrees Celsius. Also a very inhospitable place. And you see again animals such as these oryx, which have features are very similar actually to those that you see in these cold conditions. Also they needed to adapt to the absence of water and get a little bit of the water out of the very little vegetation that there is, as well as of the fog that can descend slowly in the morning. This is something that's also used by these little beetles that I show here that are able to capture some of the fog, condense it in droplets, and get water as such for the day. Remarkable things. Clearly, a lot of inspiration we can gain from this in, in the, the fields of energy, in terms of water, in terms of trying to survival and efficiency to get solutions that could help a technology. But we don't need to go to such remote places to see that in nature. In fact, if we look around us at the architecture and the dynamics of natural systems, there's very often an associated desirable properties that abound. And this stretches out from the very small scale of how DNA is packed within the nucleus of a cell to the structure of leaves or the structure of trees to how lungs and, and the heart have a very hierarchical, so-called fractal self-similar structures that links in a very efficient way the micro scale of the cell to the organ to the organism. So the scalable architectures are prevalent in nature, very efficient ways of linking the small and the large. Very often what we see is that there is optimization of transport across, across length scales with so-called process integration. So when you have certain reactions going on in the cells, that this is accompanied by separation processes that are very well integrated. You have collective phenomena that emerge from all this and lead to a very efficient, robust and scalable system. Now, this emergence of robustness is also related to the adaptability and the resilience of natural systems. Again, something we can learn both at the smaller scales within unique cells, as well as, say, for example, at how uh, sheep are flocking, how birds are, are flying together in swarms, and even these small bacteria, the bacterial communities, and how they adapt based on the environment, on how much food there is available, and how the conditions are, and they can adapt and be resilient. <laughs> more as a community than as the individual. These processes occur very often far from equilibrium. The collective dynamics are key to the efficiency of these systems. So a lot of things that we see here in these natural systems relating to both the spatial domain, the architecture, and to dynamics, things we maybe perhaps learn lessons from. And indeed, learning lessons from this, from nature, is quite old. It's almost as old as humanity, one could say. And in architecture and structural engineering, we find a lot of examples. The famous Eiffel Tower is one such example. Gustav Eiffel was, in fact, inspired by the structure of bones, of thigh bones, a femur. He was looking into this work that was uh, published by von Meyer just a few years before, and um, models constructed by Coleman 
And what he realized is that there is this balancing of forces that is present in these thigh bones, in these bones, and in this way you can have a system that's at the same time very strong and robust and also very light. So it satisfies a lot of criteria at the same time. This is how he got the idea to build this very big tower at, this, at that moment, one of the tallest buildings in the world, and you can construct it out of iron. However, you don't need to, to use more of the material. You use it in a smart way. You use it in a way that you have the same type of forces that balance out at multiple scales. That is the type of principle that one could really call nature-inspired engineering. Another example here in Britain is the one of the famous garden architecture, Joseph Paxton, who's famous from the Chatsworth and from the Crystal Palace and unfortunately burned down. Where did he get his ideas? Well, in Chatsworth, he was building a, a structure that he needed to get all these tropical plants housed. Uh, for example, big palm trees and these water lilies. In fact, these water lilies, the so-called Victorian water lilies, are very large structures that can float on the water. And you see this funny drawing here from 1849 where he put his own daughter, Annie Paxton, where she's merrily floating around on the pond. And why is this again? Well, it's the properties of those leaves. It's essential properties where you have, again, forces that balance out. So you have these transfers, girders and support, if you want, within this leaf. And he took this as an idea to build a big glass greenhouse, a greenhouse that would be very big, that needed to be out of glass so that light could go in through, could capture the heat, but at the same time it needed to be strong enough. And again, the idea was to use a balancing of forces in that structure. An idea, again, to take from nature, but not literally. And that part is essential to nature-inspired engineering. It is not copying literally from nature, but taking principles, fundamental mechanisms in nature within the new context of technology. This greenhouse does not look like this leaf, but he uses the same principles of this balancing. Now, in architecture, there's a lot of structures. If we go now to the 21st century and we look at, for example, the London Aquatic Center in the Olympic Park, signed by Zaha Hadid, or the structures in Belgrade. Now, these type of organic flowing structures could not be conceived back then. We have a lot of opportunities that are now available thanks to two main principles. One is large advances in computation and the speed of computation, efficiency of algorithms. And a second one has to do with new manufacturing methods, and that's for the realization of these structures. Another one that I really like is from Akihisa Hirata. You see these foam forms or tangling. Again, what's essential here in the architectural language is that there is a dynamic interaction of the space, of the structure, with the people and the environment. And that creates these special new spaces. So there's clearly a lot of creativity and innovation that comes from there, but that also goes together with the new methods in science and engineering that are available. When you go to my discipline, the discipline of chemical engineering, unfortunately, one sees that the levels of creativity in designs is a little bit more modest. Indeed, when we look at this, this is a picture from one of the oldest books, 16th century, on metallurgy and chemical engineering, in a sense. And you see all these vessels in series with each other. You see these turbines to stir the contents and how, you know, and pumps and so forth. And then you look at this picture of a modern chemical plant, and you see very similar structures. It's not always like that, one could argue. There is certainly a lot of innovation, but very often, most of the chemical industry is built in this way. A lot of empiricism. There's a lot of calculations that are done. There's a lot of insights and fundamental principles that are being utilized. But the essential designs are very much related to the ones that we knew centuries ago. And I can ask the question, therefore, what is really fundamentally new? And perhaps can we innovate, like we've seen in these previous examples, by drawing lessons from nature? And that's what we try to do in what I call NICE, or nature-inspired chemical engineering. It is a learning from the architecture and the dynamics of natural systems at all scales to help design and synthesize innovative solutions for technological problems. Problems related to resource efficiency, energy, water, the lack of suitable materials. Problems also in health and therapeutics and in sustainability. And a key aspect here, just like in the examples I showed in architecture, is that the basis should be mechanistic understanding, not just blind imitation. So we need to go back to essential physics, to the essential chemistry of what is going on. What are the principles behind, say, robustness or efficiency or scalability? And utilize that. And imitate it, not just imitate it, but utilize in the right context. Indeed, in technology, 
We may have access when we build, say, for example, a chemical reactor to steel, to iron, right? Which is not available in this pure form in, 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 in nature. We can have access to much higher pressures or different temperatures that are available in the physiological conditions. So we have more parameters to play with. While on the other hand, time, the dimension of time may be different. Maybe we want to produce something much more quickly. We cannot wait until the time of a beautiful tree that grows and it takes hundreds of years. Maybe we want to have a solution that, uh, that is there within, within a, a month or maybe even within hours, right? So the time scales are different. There are sometimes more constraints and sometimes there are more, there's more flexibility and more parameters we can work with. That is why we really need to think about the mechanism and how we apply it into context. And I'll discuss this a little bit more in the remaining of my talk. In fact, there are three fundamental mechanisms that we, we focus on uh, to provide guidance to engineering applications. The first one is that of these hierarchical transport networks. Hierarchical transport networks we see in leaves, in trees, in the lungs, linking the small and the large scale. A second one is that of force balancing, similar to what you see in these mechanical constructs that you see in the bones, that you see in the Eiffel Tower. But also at a nanoscale, we look at how molecules of proteins are self organizing into complexes with specific functions to help other proteins fold. Or we look at protein channels and cell membranes and how they can get water through but not salt. How is that happening? What types of forces are acting in this system? Right. And a third one is a dimension of time we call dynamic self-organization. Why do regular patterns arise on a sandy beach or on the dunes? Why do bacterial communities self-organize in particular structures? What can we learn from that? And what is the basis for this? There may be some principles behind it that lead to either structuring or to this uh, resilience. And I will show just a few examples of our work using these type of principles. The first one goes to these hierarchical transport networks that we see in leaves and that we see in trees. Now, in fact, as a chemical engineer, I like to think of a tree as a chemical reactor. The tree itself cannot grow without photosynthesis. And this photosynthesis is possible by specific complexes, chemical complexes are very complex within, the structure, within leaves. So this is something at the so-called nanoscale, the scale of billions of uh, meters, a very small scale of just molecular complexes. However, the tree wouldn't be a tree if this was not used to grow leaves, to grow the tree, the so-called biomass of this tree itself. And so also the meso and the macro scale are important. This is just like a whole reactor. It links the small scale of the um, individual cells within these leaves to the side, to the trunk itself. And the root net, through the root network, water and nutrients are transported through the smallest steps, the twigs of the tree, and go there where the cells are. This is the mesoscale. The mesoscale is the scale of the leaf itself. Also there we need a hierarchy of network, a network of channels for molecules to go where they need to go, for products to be removed. And thus there is a relation with what we could call the active sites in a catalyst. The catalyst is a substance that one uses in chemistry to speed up certain chemical reactions and or to speed them up selectively versus other reactions we don't want to occur. And this is very essential to chemical production. So this is like an active site. This is like the catalyst pore network. A lot of these catalysts are porous materials, just like a sponge, a sponge-like material. And this is like a reactor, but we'll agree that these look very different from the reactors and the catalysts that we see commonly. One example of such chemical reactors is a so-called fluidized bed. A fluidized bed is a very complex type of dynamic system. You have solid particles, for example, of catalysts, through which in a, in, a partic in a vessel, and you have a porous distributor plate, or you have some distribution mechanism, through which gas is injected, and this sets these particles into motion. And as a result of this, these particles move, and above a certain velocity, everything is, is flowing, everything is moving, and bubbles start to appear. Now, because of this, you have very efficient mixing, and that is desirable, especially when heat, say, is being produced and needs to be removed. However, these reactors turn out to be very difficult to scale up from a small lab scale to very large scale because these bubbles become larger and larger and it, the hydrodynamics are very complex and there's very poor contact between the fluid and these particles. So let me show you just some example here, a little video to actually show what this looks like. 
So you see, for example, and so two-dimensional ones, so you can look through how these bubbles are rising and you see this very complex structure of these dynamics. Now the problem is that you also, in many of these fluid beds, are being used, for example, for drying of particles, uh, for example, for pharmaceutical powders or for coating. And you see that you can also have maldistribution. And so you get clogging and you have just one channel that's going through. So this can even be dangerous or it can lead to very poor pharmaceutical products that are being generated. So these systems are very non-uniform. Now there's been a lot of progress in characterizing these systems, in modeling them. I'm not going to go into this. Uh, but despite all this progress, despite all this work, this remains a massive challenge. So the question is, can we get guidance from nature to structure the dynamics in these systems? And the first example will be to use the dimension of space. In a second way, we're going to use time. The one in space, we get inspiration from the structure of lungs and from that of trees. These so-called fractal systems, the fractal geometry that Benoit Mandelbrot uh, taught us, which are structures which are similar at multiple length scales. So these systems link, just like the tree that I showed earlier, very nicely the small scale of the cells to the large scale of these organs. Can we perhaps find ways that are scalable and use the same principles of the fractal structure that we see in our organs? Of like, for example, the vascular network or the lungs that are so efficient? Well, we see them everywhere. We see them also in these mangrove trees. We designed the so-called fractal injector, which is very much inspired by these structures and where a fluid can be distributed through a stem and comes out of this and splits up and splits up again and it could split up again to twigs and the distance from this inlet to each of these outlets is the same and in this way you can distribute very uniformly a fluid through all these exits throughout a vessel in which you put it. So you, you put that in there and instead of having a pure stirring mechanism you can distribute this fluid uniformly over the vessel. And then we're going to scale this up in a very much nature-inspired way. If you think about the tree, how, it's, how it grows, the size of the twigs of a tree, in a young and an old tree, are the same. It's just the number of levels of hierarchy, the number of generations that's different from a small to a large tree. That is how scale-up is done. Very different from what we typically do in process engineering of building things bigger with all the parts bigger. So it's a very different way of thinking about it. And so what we would do is, in a small vessel, you're going to use a distributor like that. This is one that's built out of steel. It's a photograph. It's computer generated. And if you want to make a large one, you grow it in a modular way. These things would be very hard to produce until a number of years ago. But now with the new manufacturing methods, the scalable architecture are much more facile uh, to make. And so again, we can use this nature-inspired concept here because the size of the twigs, if you wish, are the same in these two and you get this uniform distribution in a similar way from a small to a large vessel. So how does it work? Well, again, let's show that same uh, or similar video of a fluid bed that I showed before. This would be regularly when you distribute all the fluid from the bottom. And now if you're going to distribute some of this fluid through this fractal injector, what we see is a much more uniform distribution of these bubbles. They become much smaller because the gas uniformly gets to all the particles, the catalytic particles or the particles that need to be dried and is very uniformly distributed and you have direct contact between the gas and the solids. So this has a lot of advantages. So what this leads to is essentially better reactor performance. What, this curve, what these curves show is that you, if you increase the fraction of the gas that goes through this fractal injector that's shown here, then the yield of products and the selectivity to the products you want to make can in this way be improved without changing any of the total throughput. This example re refers to the production of this chemical here that is the basis for polyesters that go into boats and lorries or trucks and pipes and so forth. So a second example is there where we learn from nonlinear dynamics patterns that we see when you have the action of the wind or of the water on the, on the, in, the, in the beach, then you, you get these very regular patterns in the sand. You see the same thing in these picture that I took in, in Namibia where you have these very regular patterns on the dunes and the dunes themselves are also a form of pattern formation. So you get a self-organization despite the complexity of the granular dynamics of sand, this constant perturbation of the system, the working, the pulsing of the wind or of the water leads to this regularity. The physics behind this are not trivial, they're quite difficult, but there's been a lot of work in physics to explain that. And physicists have also looked at how you have 
particles which are put on plates and when you vibrate them, you can similarly get these very regular and different types of patterns. So this gave us an idea of saying, well, if we continuously perturb the gas flow in this reactor that I just showed, in the same way we just oscillate and perturb it in the same way, maybe we also get some type of structuring. And indeed, that's really what we see. This is an example, again, the same fluid bed. And here we're going to oscillate the gas flow, the same total throw rate, but we're going to oscillate the flow. And you see this very nice hexagonal pattern of bubble, very regular. This is, again, not trivial because these are not perfect spheres, they're not perfect bubbles. So there's a very complex um, uh, um, hydrodynamics going on there. But this is really a scalable system. You can make a bigger bed and you get a very similar type of structure. So it's a way of structuring through dynamics, through self-organization, by looking and taking ideas now of something not alive in nature, just looking at how um, uh, these regular patterns form in sands. In three dimensions, we see the same thing. You have a cylindrical fluid bed. You look from the top, and again, you get this type of self-organization and different types of patterns that uh, form. So you can use this, for example, to improve this drying. I showed you earlier how you when you have cohesive powders, such as in pharmaceutical powders that you want to dry, and you have this bad distribution. Well, if you oscillate the flow, you get in the same time in two minutes, we call it part of the particle, so you can more easily see the mixing, you get this very uniform and easy mixing. So it is constant perturbation of the system that leads to that. Nice way, I think, to quote William Blake here, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. That's really what we see here, isn't it? Let's go back to our tree as a chemical reactor, the link between the nanoscale and the macroscale. Active sites, the catalyst pore network, the reactor. We use these principles to design and synthesize new types of porous catalysts for processes such as the one I showed you before. In this, again, you will use porous materials with a very high surface area, sometimes the size of a whole football field with only a few grams of materials, the sponges, the so-called nanopores, pores that are only a few billions of a meter uh, in width, so the size of individual molecules. But if you have that, then you have this network of pores that extends over quite large distances, and large distances can be millimeters, which is very large compared to a nanometer, right? Million times larger. And so you have this vast network. Molecules can't go where they need to go, and products can't be removed. And so what's important is to have distribution channels in there as well. We need to put in larger highways, avenues, large roads, right, just like in cities. And this will help molecules to go where they need to go, and products to be removed. Again, something we see when we look at the structure of uh, leaves. And this goes together. We do a lot of optimization, computational optimization studies to get the best structures, but it goes together again with synthesis techniques. Like I was showing you in architecture and building, right? Also here, there's a lot of innovation in new methods to synthesize materials where we can control matter increasingly in a three-dimensional way with almost atomistic resolution, all right? And so we can make composite of the so-called zeolites is a type of catalyst, and we can control the size of these crystals, and control the size of the pores in between, and this way modulate the transport and make these more efficient. So that's that meso scale. One example where this is very important is so-called fuel cells, PEM fuel cells. Fuel cells, for those of you not familiar with it, are an electrochemical device, and they are able to go beyond the so-called Carnot efficiency, with traditional combustion, which is really limited thermodynamically, you know, by the temperature where you uh, can, can operate. In these fuel cells, you can circumvent that. You have a continuous transformation of chemical energy that is provided through fuel, for example, hydrogen in a PM fuel cell, which is not directly reacting with air or oxygen to make water, but doing this through a catalyst, a so-called electrocatalyst, and to, do, and to draw a current from this. So you have transformation of chemical energy hydrogen that's provided constantly in electrical energy. Very interesting, there's been a lot of work on this for over a century, and still there remain tons of challenges. The problem is that the most, uh, the, some of the best catalysts and the ones used most are very expensive, they're noble metals, like platinum. There are these mass transfer limitations. Remember, the molecules need to go where they need to go, and products need to be removed. One of the products here, hydrogen and oxygen reacting and forming water, is how do you remove the water? The water can condense and be liquid, and gases can more easily move, so they will clog the channels of these catalysts. 
and they cannot be easily uh, removed on these, on these plates on both sides of this fuel cell. So we have stability issues as well. Now, this is well known in, in, um, in fuel cell technology, and uh, usually what, is, what, what happens is that the, um, the, both the fuel and the, um, the air or the oxygen, they go through these so-called snake-like channels, these serpentine channels or parallel channels, and we just see what these rainbow colors really mean is that things are not uniform, okay? The oxygen concentration at different places is not the same, and as a result, the electric current that you're drawing and the current density is very non-uniform. When this is non-uniform, it means that you're not using the catalyst as well, so you're wasting a lot of expensive resource, and this water may also clog particular places, and you have stability issues, etc. So again, we turn to nature. We look at lungs and the structure of lungs. Now, in fuel, in, in, um, in the lung, we, when we breathe in, we breathe into a trachea, and these split, and they split again into until you go to the smallest bronchioles and then to the alveoli. There are 14 to 16 levels of self-similar fractal branching in an adult human lung. It's amazing. And then there is, a, and this is with cartilage, and then afterwards, the tissue change to soft tissue in the alveoli where you have exchange with the bloodstream. Now what's remarkable in this is that you have this fractal system, but again, we should not imitate purely a fractal system. We have to think about the physics that are going on. You have flow in the largest levels, and then on the smaller scales, you have the random motion of molecules, so-called diffusion, that is dominating transport. So it's not anymore the pressure-driven flow. So you have a change of physics from flow to diffusion, and this happens exactly where the structure changes from fractal to uniform, just like grapes on a bunch. So this happens, chemical engineers call this quantify this by some dimensionless number called the Peclet number, and that number is about one. And that's where this changes. And so that's what we're going to use as a principle for our fuel cell. So instead of that serpentine channel, what we use is a fractal channel, a distributor, also like in that fluidized bed, but now two-dimensional. We split in an H structure, then again an H, again an H, and so we get this type of shower head, but with very uniform distribution because of equal distances, from this one inlet to each of the outlets. And we can also recollect the water through a structure that's embedded in there in the same way. Again, a few years ago, you could only dream of such structures. That's too complicated, people would say. How can you make such a thing? But now we have techniques such as ad additive manufacturing that is becoming more and more prevalent, becoming cheaper and cheaper, and makes it possible to make such structures, to literally print them out, right? This is 3D printing. And at the smallest scale, we're going to use porous catalysts, like I showed schematically before, and where we can optimize the pore structure so that the diffusion is optimized and where we have a very uniform structure. And again, there's been a lot of progress in material synthesis to be able to control pore size and where this matter goes. And so one of some of the results here, just to show you one result, is, I mean, these are photographs actually at multiple generations. So we can increase the number of generations that we print. This one is in a plastic. This one is in stainless steel, so you don't see the fractal generations anymore. And the current density that we draw as a function of the number of branching generation goes up quite a bit with these number of branching generations because of the more uniform utilization of the catalyst underneath. These dots here are experimental points and these lines are theory. So there's a very good agreement, although we still have a lot of challenges to overcome. There's still partial flooding of this. We don't yet come to this plateau. We need to manufacture to more levels. Just there where, like in nature, where you see the speckle number of one, if you recall, where you go, like in the lung, from flow to diffusion, to these smallest channels. So a lot of challenges to overcome in terms of material synthesis, in terms of manufacturing, but we are really getting there. These tools are becoming available, and this is really an, a, an opportunity. So in leaves, same thing, just to tell you, it's not just in the lung, from more fractal structure to more uniform, the same transition from flow to diffusion. So this methodology is really to go from looking at nature, looking at the structure of the lungs, getting a concept out of there, the fractal system, the uniform system, and then coming up with a design where we can use methodologies from, say, mechanical engineering and additive manufacturing methods, and those of synthesis and chemistry of how to make, say, specific so-called nanoporous carbons, for example, and so that we can achieve uh, 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 these, these goals of scalability, efficiency, robustness, etc. So finally, I would like to say something about that one concept I haven't talked about yet at the nano level, this force balancing mechanism. 
Now, there are these so-called complexes in nature called chaperones. Chaperones, they help proteins to fold. So we see an actual micrograph of this, a computer-generated image here. This here is 4.5 nanometers wide, so-called Gruel complex. Proteins can enter this complex, and then there is a little cap that closes it, a Gruess complex. And when this cap closes, the cavity inside is charged, and the protein that is stuck in there, or an enzyme that gets in there, gets folded. Now, that folding is important because many enzymes are only active when they have a particular three-dimensional structure, three-dimensional architecture. So the way the particular shape is extremely important. It's not just the sequence, say, of that you have of these amino acids. It's a three-dimensional structure that matters. And don't worry about all the details here unless you're, you're an expert, but the biophysicists, biochemists have done a lot of studies to actually look at the mechanism of how this works. And it turns out that both the, the size of these cavities and the charge is really important. Now, nature inspired engineering, we would like to think how can we stabilize enzymes, enzymes that we would like to use, say, for food products, for therapeutics, for health. There's a lot of biologics now on the market, more and more, or that we can use in biochemical engineering processes. And nature inspired engineering means we're not necessarily going to mimic that immediately, or imitate that whole complex structure, but we're using, why not? These mesoporous, nanoporous materials that I showed uh, before. So these are nanoporous materials with a controlled pore size, so-called SBA15, first synthesized in Santa Barbara. And we can make little rods of these that are only a thousand nanometers or micrometer in size and with all parallel pores. And the size of these pores is about the same size as one of these enzymes. And what we can do is we can stabilize enzymes. We can confine them in there. We can and, and uh, we can look at how this would affect a chemical reaction. An enzyme can catalyze, it's a biological catalyst, can catalyze particular chemical reactions, and we can look at how well it's doing that. So you can see the enzyme free in solution have, carries out a reaction, and we can immobilize it in these materials and see how it carries out the same reaction. So what we've seen is that this gray bar here shows the activity that we have of an enzyme free in solution. The same amount of enzymes that you put in these materials with different sizes of pores, and you see how the activity increases to six to eight fold when the pores are narrower and just about the size of this enzyme itself. You see this in this cartoon here, I'll put just snugly in there. It's just that the enzyme cannot branch out as easily, it cannot reach out. So there's a certain stabilization going on. So there's certainly a steric confinement, a way that it is uh, helped and supported by that environment. But what we've seen here, and I always show the pictures of my, my, my students who work on this as you've, you've, uh, you've seen in, in the laboratory. And what we see here is that you see this increase in activity in these narrow pores, but if you make these pores so-called hydrophobic, which means hating water instead of hydrophilic loving water, you, you put chemical groups on them so that the water does not uh, easily, uh, there's not as easy interactions with those uh, enzymes, you see that the activity decreases. So you don't get the same effect, same size. So it's not just a size effect. What is matters is also the chemistry. And what is happening here is in effect, these experiments are carried out at a particular level of acidity, so-called pH. And these proteins themselves, depending on the pH, can carry a charge, just like the materials can carry a charge. And when these charges are the opposite, one is positively charged and the other one is negatively charged, then they will attract each other. That's so-called electrostatics. And that's exactly what happened in these chaperones that are not just steric confining, but are also helping to fold these enzymes. That's exactly what we see here. You need both the size, the steric confinement, and you need the charge. And so we are using this for um, uh, considering particles where you can modulate the shape, you can modulate the structure on the outside. And so we could start thinking about applying this for all kinds of therapeutic uses, whether it is intravenous or enteral uh, uh, use. A final problem that I want to talk about is water, right? The albatross, right? Coleridge, as he said, water, water, everywhere. And all the boards, they drink. Water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Now, this, in reality, is, of course, the albatross sees the salt water, and it can perhaps drink it, but people cannot drink it. And more than a billion people on Earth don't have access to fresh, safe drinking water. So that is a considerable challenge. And so we are looking into solutions, again, learning from nature. Because in the membrane of a cell, 
in cell membranes, there are these protein channels that are only the size of a water molecule wide, so-called aquaporin, and through computer simulations, we can see through studies that water molecules can be channeled through, but salt does not go through. And again, these are electrostatic effects, there are steric effects, it's a balancing of the different forces that are going on. Instead of in the Eiffel Tower, where these mechanical forces, it's sterics, electrostatics that are acting together, the dielectrics in there, they all play a role. And so this principle, if you look at this, the, the rapidity with which this happens in cells, three billion molecules of water per second through each channel, this principle could clean buckets of waters in minutes. And so we are interested, and this is what we're working on, of designing membranes and synthesizing membranes that use these concepts, the similar materials I just showed you to confine these enzymes, where we functionalize them, chemically change them inside and outside in such a way that we use the same principles from these biological membranes. So here I'd like to conclude and say what I've hoped and tried to convey is that we can learn a lot from nature to innovate and guide solutions to challenging problems, problems related to energy, to water, to health, to sustainability. Important here is that we don't take this as a dogma. We don't try to imitate nature as such. No blind biomimetics. We need to think about the fundamental mechanisms that prevail and which can be applied in the right context over technological problems. What we often do find is that the distribution systems we see in nature are often self-similar fractal like the lung and the trees on large scales where flow is dominating and very uniform on the small scale. The nanoscale is extremely complex and nano confinement effects play a major role and we can also use these principles. And dynamics we can of course also use. So it's rational design in space and in time. Now these novel synthesis and manufacturing methods that are now uh, coming up, that are now uh, some of them really there and coming to market, can really be utilized to change these dreams really into reality, right? And um, so basically what we've shown is taking these examples from these different mechanisms, we can design these different types of solutions. I would like to conclude here, and for those who are not here, but looking online, I mean, this lecture is given in the Darwin Lecture Theater. This is the place where Darwin actually used to live for a number of years. I feel particularly honored to give this presentation here. I mean, to quote from Darwin, right, he said in The Origin of, uh, of Species, it is interesting to contemplate an entangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. These laws, taken in the largest sense, being growth with reproduction, inheritance, which is almost implied by reproduction, variability from the indirect and direct action of the external conditions of life, and from use and disuse, a ratio of increase so high as to lead to a struggle for life, and as a consequence to natural selection, entailing divergence of character and the extinction of less improved forms. Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. I find this a wonderful text, right? I find this wonderful, and you know that it's hanging outside on the door. These are the last words of the origin of species, and what we try to see is can we learn from these evolved and sometimes optimal principles that we see in nature over all these eons, right? Can we learn to find solutions for our technological challenges? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marc Guillier. Uh, and for reminding us of the necessity of introducing poetry into engineering. <laughs> humanities. Engineering is a humanity, I believe. So, um, we have time for a couple of questions, if any members of the audience would like to begin. We have one lady at the back here, please. Um, thank you very much. That was one of the most brilliant lectures I've heard in the lunchtime lecture. Um, uh, my question's probably a bit idiotic, but I've been reading a lot about the Mars expedition of putting people on Mars. Some of these things must apply when they're trying to reproduce complex life systems and how to live. Would, how would these things apply um, I mean, I, my question's a bit general because it's only just occurred to me, but are they very useful 
when they go to Mars? That's a very good question. I mean, I would say that if you are in such conditions, it's even harsher than those images I showed at the beginning of Spitsbergen and, and of the Namibian deserts. Also, sometimes people go into these regions to try to learn what it would be like, right? And in deserts, there are stations where there are studies, um, uh, for example, that NASA is also using in, in, in the United States as well, to, uh, to try to see how one could live under such inhospitable conditions. Clearly, there is even though there may not be uh, life in, in those uh, places, or, or uh, uh, um, it is, uh, one will have to be extremely efficient. One will have to go to efficiency, robustness, to the extreme under such conditions, because resources will be very limited. And so we, I think that is an extra reason to try to look at principles where there are organisms that are able to survive Seemingly there's no water and that beetle survives, but it can get a bit of fog or there are organisms that can uh, uh, live under very high temperatures or for very long times without water. How can we learn about this? How can we learn about, uh, you know, the possibility of recycling and, and uh, looking at the whole uh, question of sustainability? That becomes even more uh, important when you go to such regions and one has to survive for years. Probably will have to grow own plants and so forth, but how can you do this for years, efficiency will be everything there, and uh, efficiency of energy, water, and so forth. So these lessons, I th say, would certainly be uh, applicable there. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, I'm afraid that we must close now because there's another class of students of, about to come in. Um, could, I, could I ask you to remember to fill in the, uh, the evaluation form and hand it to the uh, ladies on the outside? And uh, to remind you that there's another lunchtime lecture uh, in here on Thursday. Thank you. Bye.